Welcome everybody. Hi. Um, some of you I, I know familiar faces, some of you are new faces. Um, we're delighted to have you with us at um, the first of our Learn and Grow series. The Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory offers lots of education opportunities and each year in the spring leading into our annual plant sale, we offer the Learn and Grow series. It's three weeks in a row and um, we have tonight um, preparing for the growing season with our um, speaker, Don Necrocious. And uh, next week, we will be featuring container gardening with our director of horticulture, Patty Staley. And then in our third week on April 17th, we have a speaker from the um, University of Illinois Extension Master Gardener Program, and um, he will be speaking on pest management for veggies, something we've really never offered before. So I'm very much looking forward to that um, next lecture. So really our mission is to help you be more confident in your garden and all of your gardening endeavors. And that's why we put on this series. We also have all of our previous lectures that were recorded on our website, so you can access those. And this one will be recorded and added um, at the end of the series as well. So um, if you're looking for um, information on dahlias or garlic, um, we have had some of the most wonderful presenters. And um, so go check out our website for more. Um, I do uh, wanna emphasize that our annual plant sale, it's our 35th annual plant sale. It is now open to members only. Uh, you can still join before April 14th when we open to the public if you want early access to seeing some of the most glorious plants available for your containers and for your veggie garden. So. Our um, annual plant sale is underway right now, and it's one of the most exciting times of year um, because all of our volunteers start to come back on a daily basis, and they're working in the soil, and they're potting up those plants, and the greenhouses are filling up to the brim. So you can tell I get very excited about these things, especially the plant sale. So enough of that. Let me get on to introducing Don. Um, Don Necrocious is an avid gardener and longstanding member of the Friends. He teaches classes in backyard and worm composting, seed starting, vegetable gardening, and garden tool care. He planted his first garden on Valentine's Day in 1972 and has been in love with flowers and vegetable gardening ever since. I also want to introduce my co-host this evening. We have Casey Nikoloff with us and she will manage the chat and the Q&A. So please put your questions in the chat box and at the end, we'll open it up for questions and we'll do our best to answer everything for you. So Don, are you ready to roll? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So um, Don Necrocious, um, thank you for being here and I'm gonna turn it over to you and mute myself and we'll, um, we'll check in towards the end of the program. Thank you, Judy. Um, well, uh, snow. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, I, I have to admit, I get happy whenever I see snow flowing, floating down, uh, and I may be different than most people about that, but to me, it's just beautiful. Spring is the season that we kind of all hope for, uh, and when it arrives, our, our juices get flowing, and we can't wait to start working in the garden. I want to say good evening to old friends and new. A lot of us have been around each other for a long time. I think I joined the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory in 1987. And so uh, we have a lot of exposure to each other. And the things that I covered tonight, if you know them, uh, that's great. If, if you take a few charges to duty, that's better yet. I want to thank the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory and, uh, and his, uh, its board, and especially the executive director, director Judy Clem, who, uh, when we talk about the conservatory as a gem, she's one of the jewels in, uh, in the diadem that is the conservatory. Uh, well, Let's look at that first slide. Oh, yeah. Why is this happening, my dear? Oh, we got it. All right, there we are. Gardeners in the know know these bullet points. And so, again, some of this might be reviewed. The right plant in the right place with the right culture is how you succeed. Something that people sometimes overlook is the second point, adding organic matter to the soil on a yearly basis. Uh, if we had a Q&A or an audience here, I'd ask, what's the best organic matter? Think of it for a second. Think of the answer to that. You're right, it's compost. That's the best organic matter, but there's others. Uh, 
gardeners know also to lessen or stop altogether the using, use of chemical pesticides. Uh, this is very damaging. Also, experiment with new varieties. Something new, if we do the same thing year after year after year, we haven't learned anything. It's a wonderful definition of learning. It's changed behavior. And if your behavior hasn't changed, you haven't learned anything. So one way to change your gardening behavior is find a new plant or find a new technique even. I'm a big uh, adherent to uh, Socrates' quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I never figured out how to turn that around for gardens. But basically, I think keeping a journal and making reflections, making notes on what's going on uh, is a wonderful habit to form. And uh, it, it assists in that learning that we talked about. Uh, I want to mention the name Bob Hastman here. A lot of us know Bob, uh, who, when he would send emails out, he would address them to his garden buddies. And uh, that's an idea that is very powerful, that if you find a collaborator, somebody with whom you can talk or share seeds or recipes or leftover harvest, uh, it's an excellent strategy for success. And that leads to the next point of sharing the harvest. The sharing some with your family, of course, certainly with your neighbors, and also with the various food pantries that surround us. They need the fresh food. Gardeners are famous for being overly ambitious. You know, we open up too much ground. We get set ourselves too great a, a, a task. So I, I want to advise not to overdo it. And then finally, something that is important to keep in mind, which is to sit quietly in your garden and enjoy nature. It's not just a place to work and slave away, but also to uh, simply enjoy the, uh, can I use the fancy word, the gestalt uh, of the event, you know, what you've brought to bear. Let's see if maybe I can make this thing obey. There we go. So here's a list of what we're gonna cover tonight. The first is kind of uh, to survey and plan and make goals, talking about seeds and, and uh, ordering them. Uh, kind of taking a dive into soil, uh, then sowing some seeds both for uh, now and in the in the in the garden, lawn maintenance and care, a, a word or two about tools, uh, one of my favorite topics, compost, and finally a brief word about uh, cleanup. Something that we're, we're kind of anxious to do, but there's an issue going on with that. This opening slide asks you to take a look at the USDA hardiness map for Illinois. It's kind of colorful, it's kind of pretty colors. If you look up in the upper right hand corner, right along Lake Michigan, you'll see the sliver that encompasses Cook County, even goes a little farther west than that. But this has declared what our hardiness zones is. The little key in the lower left hand side of that map shows you that it refers to uh, the lowest temperature that we achieve in the wintertime used to be uh, 5B when when I was a kid, which is about when the glacier receded from Lake Michigan. But nonetheless, uh, right now it's five to 10 degrees below zero. So as the slide says, our average last frost is April 15th. That's at about 10 days, 11 days away, 12. And the average first frost is October 24th. That's about 192 uh, gardening days of a year not counting what you would do uh, after and before those dates. But actually, you, you and I know that's, that's too long a span. It stays pretty cold into May, and it starts getting cold late September. So basically, what we're, when we're talking about a gardening year, we're pretty much saying May 15th to about September 15th, although there are things we can do um, before then. A lovely place to start thinking about is the gardening year, and you probably a lot of you already have, is to take a long, loving look at your garden, a careful look, and ask yourself, what happened last year? What grew in that bed over there? How did that shrub bloom? Did something change over time? Has somebody put up a fence uh, and shaded out an area that you used to, or has a tree been taken out? And so you have that thing we all desire in uh, snug together homes in Oak Park, more sun. We kind of live in a shade garden almost. Then you'd spend to take some time to envision what it is that you'd like to grow in the in this coming season. And this is where I end by saying, I wish you keep a, a, a gardener's journal. Now you see a kind of commercial form of one right there. I like to use composition notebooks. They're very, very inexpensive, ready to hand. Uh, and I often make notes at the end of a garden session and certainly do at the end of a gardening year 
to review what happened, what I liked, and interestingly, what I'd heard about or seen while I was moving through either Oak Park or the wider world. So that at this time of year, one of the first things I do is open that journal from last year and read through what I thought happened, what I what I cared about, what I promised myself I would be doing. Uh, I want to give a, a bow here to Judy who uh, put together some of the visuals for these slides. Uh, that's just marvelous. Okay, soil. Something that people often overlook. They, they just don't think about it. You know, I'm going to garden, but they think about plants or they think about hardscape. Uh, but soil is really where it's all happening. And as you know, it's a mineral. Basically, it's, it's rock that's been beat the heck by the sun and wind and rain. It's made of silt and sand and loam. And I'm just going to flip real quick, I think, to the next slide that shows you a graphic that's uh, pretty famous. This has three points, this triangle. If you look lower left, there's sand. Lower right is silt. Up top is sand. Uh, and these are the three basic types of soil that there are. Let's see if I go back to the better soil. Whoop, whoop. You forgive me. Soil is alive. I mean, it's alive. That's why we never use the word dirt. Dirt is dead. Soil is alive. If you picked up a handful of soil, you may think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. There are billions of life forms in that handful of soil, some of which are micro macrobiological. You can see them. Many of them are invisible, and they all live in a web of activity, taking care of each other and also creating the nutrients that are the roots of the plants take up. So these life forms are essential to healthy, healthy plants. And one of the ways to feed the soil is to add more organic matter every year. The optimum percentage of organic matter in soil is about 5%. And I would guess that most gardens are down around 3%. We tend to use it up. If you ever see a picture of a soil that looks like it's full of bark or twigs or leaves, that's a high percentage of organic matter. As you know, uh, the nutrients that plants need, uh, the three that we see on fertilizer bags, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those are for leaf growth, the nitrogen, phosphorus for stem growth, potassium for withstanding drought and health. Uh, these are primary chemicals that come into our plants to the roots uh, or sometimes with a foliar fertilizer, but there are about a dozen more. And that's why when I said before, what's the best organic matter to add, uh, compost is it, whether you make it yourself to get it from the village or you buy commercial forms of it, they have those micronutrients in it. And let me just suggest, uh, it comes to mind right now that there are a couple of local nurseries that sell to us, including Good Earth, which carries a variety of a brand of potting soil that has all those micronutrients in it. And you want to be looking for those. So to find out what shape your soil is in, how to learn about your soil is to do a soil test. And I'm providing you on this slide with three do-it-yourself tests. The first is the clump test. And basically what you do is uh, this requires that the soil be moist, but not wet. You never work in wet soil because it compacts into brick. Uh, and that it be relatively warm, 50 degrees or more. And it certainly isn't that now. Imagine what the soil is on a day like today, probably just like the air down in the 30s. Well, damp, relatively warm reach down, you grab a handful of soil and squeeze it real hard, and then open your hand and bounce that clump. If that clump breaks up easily, you've got silt, you've got a loam, you've got an excellent soil. If when you squeeze it and open your hand and it stays in that same shape with a good bounce, you've got clay, which has virtues. It holds fertility, but it also uh, holds too much water and doesn't let air get into it. And if you open your hand and the soil sifts through easily, that's sand. And sand is a, a, a neat thing, especially if you're trying to grow root vegetables to have those long roots spread out. But uh, it doesn't hold fertility. In fact, uh, it, uh, it drains water too quickly. And it's not just that water drains through the sand. What also happens is it takes the fertility with it. And so you have a less fertile garter, garden, and that fertility tends to move into the environment, which we don't want to have happen. Well, the best way to learn about what's in your soil is to do a scientific soil test, to send a sample off to get it tested. The, what that will get you is a, a good readout on what proper nutrient or what are the nutrients in your soil and what are the ones necessary for the plants you want to grow. 
it also helps balance the chemistry in the soil. There's not too much of this and not too much of that. You can actually over fertilize fairly easily. And I think probably a lot of us are doing that. You may know that uh, uh, the Cook County soils are pretty high in phosphorus all the time anyway. Um, and then uh, it saves money. If you know what's in your soil, you don't have to add other things to it. Let's see what happens if I try to advance the slide. Ah, too many. All right, let me try this one over here. Uh, Judy. Which oh. one are you, which one are you looking for? Uh, the, uh, the uh, another soil test slide. But let me just go ahead. There is a company, not a company. It's a it's a entity called the uh, Cook County Farm Bureau. Please don't be put off by the word farm in that title. It really is meant to serve the farmers of Illinois, but it had so many requests on uh, soil tests that it created a special program for garden uh, gardeners who want to test their soil. So they're available online. What you do is you go online, you ask them for an application and pay for a fee. They send you a soil test kit, which is basically a set of instructions and a little bag. And you go into your soil and, you, uh, and your garden and you take 10 samples from around the garden put it in the bag, mail it off, and before very too long, you can get a, a detailed readout of N and P and K, pH, as well as percent organic matter. Now, I bet a lot of you haven't done that, and you really need to do it at least every five years. They, they often say every three years. Best time to do it, to tell you the truth, is in the fall after the season when you've used up most of the nutrients in the soil, and then you know what to amend in the spring. But if you haven't done it in a while, spring is just a just fine time to do it. And they're very, very helpful people. The last thing to say about them is not only do you get the soil test results back, but they put you in contact with a master gardener who talks you through those results and explains what you need to do and how much, uh, and very specifically, how much you need to add of what. Sometimes you have to change the pH uh, a little bit. All right. Here's a wonderful display of seeds. And uh, one of the fun things we have about gardening is, is going through catalogs and looking for seeds. Uh, one of my favorite catalogs, you probably have yours too, but one of my favorite catalogs is Johnny's uh, select, Selected Seeds. I think they're from Maine. I, I was looking at that catalog today and you're gonna think I'm exaggerating here, but they have over 75 varieties of lettuces different lettuces, over 70 different, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, uh, this one was 40 different sunflowers, different kinds of sunflowers that you might want to grow in your garden. Lots and lots of uh, special things like buckwheat, rye, and vetch that you can use to either as a green manure crop or for sowing in your garden in the fall. Winter rye is a great thing to, to sow in the fall, and that's the thing that you'd be doing in the spring is turning that under. If you've never done that, if you've finished harvesting, let's say your, your peat crop uh, that you planted in the spring and you've got a bare patch of ground, if you sow into it buckwheat, let it grow and then turn it under before it flowers, you would be shocked at what happens to the soil. It gets fluffy. It begins to wiggle. It's so full of life. It creates excellent what's called tilt. Uh, one of the uh, seed packets here. Actually, there's two seed packets here from the same company. They're in the, just the right of center. It's called Botanical Interests. One is for Oregon sugar pot peas, and the other is for giant purple zinnias. That, if you ever get a chance to buy one of those seed packets, do it. No matter what the seed is, because it's a seed packet that's a really uh, rich thing. It not only has information on picture on the cover and information on the back, but both interior pages of the of the seed packet are like a mini horticultural lesson all based on that particular plant so it not only uh how to plant it it gives you the history of the plant it gives you some kitchen garden suggestions um it, it's a wonderful wonderful uh, uh seed company and seed packet i got them at um uh good earth as well as uh whole foods i don't know if they're still carrying them but i wouldn't be surprised if they are hey, uh, John, it's Judy. If you could just sit a little bit closer to your computer so we can hear you a little bit more. Sure. I'm getting a couple of comments about the volume. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try and speak a little bit louder. There's a, this is a chart uh, that uh, if you've gone through your seeds and picking some new ones, 
you might notice that in your seed grouping, you have some left over from the previous years. And you ask yourself, are they viable? Can they be brought back to life? And this is a chart from the Chicago Botanic Garden. There are other charts available to you. I'm just fascinated by this. I, I love to go far over to the right, the six-year column. Look what's uh, viable after six years. Pumpkins and squash and cucumber. I mean, how often do you plant all of the seeds in a pumpkin packet? Well, you could save those for six years. In the, excuse me, in the four-year column, there's tomato. You know, we, we start maybe six, maybe 10 tomato seeds. Uh, and there's a whole bunch more in there. You can save them. Now, what's good saving means that you put them in a cool, dark, dry place, something like in a clean jar, uh, maybe in your basement over the summertime, and they'll be just fine. Uh, I'm always shocked when we're giving a tour at the conservatory to visitors. If you say to them, a seed is alive, they get surprised by that. We never think that that's a, a living entity, but it is, and they can continue to live for a period of time. Let me just brag that the oldest tomato seed I ever used was a nine-year-old seed. I got it to sprout. I got it to make a plant, but I have to tell you that it was a weak plant that didn't produce well. And I think that was an example of genetics wearing out over time, whether cosmic rays are, are hitting it or whatever. But again, uh, you don't need to save seeds. I'm a little surprised at the sweet corn in uh, column two, because corn seeds really have a longer longevity of that, but I would bow to the botanic garden there. So if you have leftover seeds, store them correctly, and uh, now is the time to bring them out. It is time to uh, do some sowing, but take a look at those two dates. Here we are at April 3rd, and there may be people itching to get out there and start sowing seeds. These, by, these dates, by the way, for these, these vegetable crops come from the University of Illinois Extension, and uh, they have a wonderful uh, in-depth treatment of horticulture. Most any question you have, you can find, uh, find an answer to there. Uh, 12 days from now, you can start outdoors uh, kale, lettuce, onion, and spinach. And they like the, the cold weather. If you were to put a pepper seed in the ground at this time, nothing would happen. If you put a corn uh, niblet out there, corn seed out right now, it would mold uh, if, if not some critter would get it. So that, as you know, there are tender early vegetables. There are half hearty ones. There's full hearty ones. Well, these are the earlies. And then even a week or, or a week, nine days later, on October 20, uh, April 24th, beets and chard, peas and carrots. A quick word about beets. A beet seed is not a single seed. It's a colony. So when you put it in the ground, it will sprout three, four plants right next to each other. And what's true about beets uh, is that you have to thin them to be able to get that nice round bulb. That's also true of carrots. So the trick with carrots, if you, if you have experience with them, is that it's a very tiny seed. And planting all of these, there's the, uh, the information that uh, you plant a seed four times the diameter of the seed in depth. So if a seed is a uh, like a, a, a lettuce seed, it's very tiny. And uh, I'll tell you the truth, I've actually dribbled lettuce seed on top of snow. And as the snow melted, the seed hit the soil and sprouted. It, it doesn't mind. And there are those seeds that actually need light for, for germination, like uh, dill. Uh, dill needs two things, light and heat. And so does so dill seed. That's a summertime crop. Uh, what, one thing I kind of want to suggest is something that I've done in the past and I saw uh, at the university, I'm sorry, at Museum of Science and Industry Smart Home Garden, where I used to hang around a bunch. We built a little bit of a salad quilt. So we took a patch of ground in the springtime at least 24 inches square, divided it into four segments on the diagonal. So we had four quadrants. And in one quadrant, we put spinach, another a red leaf lettuce, another kale, and another a, a green lettuce. And sowed them very thickly. So you had a mini salad garden. And as those things came along, uh, it was just beautiful. Uh, it's, it's a way to make a delicious, beautiful salad garden. Uh, and just a quick word about peas. Uh, if you're not having too much success with them, it, uh, peas need uh, an enzyme in the soil. And there are inoculants for that available to you online. Uh, if you've grown peas in the same place before, that is now already in the soil. And as you know, it's a legume, which has uh, nitrogen-fixing nodules in the roots, uh, which is 
um, very helpful to all kinds of plants that grow there. So these are direct so early vegetables. Quick word about the big three, and the reason I call them the big three is these are the three most popular vegetables grown by home gardeners, tomatoes and cucumber and peppers. And uh, draw your attention to the starting date for tomatoes. Well, maybe go to the second one, the set out date for tomatoes, May 24th. I know a lot of people locally say Mother's Day, which I think is May 12th this year. I may have that wrong. That would be 12 days too soon, according to uh, University of Illinois Extension. And what it really has to do with is the temperature of the soil and the temperature of the air. If you put a tomato plant in the ground when the soil is cold and the air is cold, you actually set it back on its progress of maturation. So you don't want to rush it. And I've seen a lot of examples on social media lately where people have already started the tomato seeds and they're too tall, they're leggy, and they're a struggle to deal with. So tomato seeds get planted six to eight weeks before they go in the ground. Working way backward, that's April 15th. That's still 12 days or 13 days or 12 days in front of us. So don't rush it. You still have time to go find some wonderful seeds. Another catalog is a catalog called Totally Tomatoes. Oh, that's what had 75 different, there were 75 different tomatoes in, in John Ace of Seeds. Can you imagine 75 different tomatoes? Okay, so cucumbers are also uh, started very early, but uh, as I'm suggesting here, they'd be started in peat pots, which you know those compressed little fibrous pots. And uh, the reason you do that is because they don't like to have their roots disturbed when they're set out in the garden, the grumpy little things. And um, one thing to remember about doing that is when you put the peat pot in the soil is to break off the top edge of the peat pot. If you leave it above the soil, it will act as a wick and, uh, and dry out the root ball underneath it. So you just break it off and drop them and they'll uh, and do just fine. But look at the dates for cucumber. May 1st for seed sowing and June 1st for setting out. Boy, we're all anxious to get out in the garden. Can we possibly wait till May 1st to plant uh, seeds in there? Well, yeah, we should for the, for the best gardening advice. Peppers is a, a, an odd plant that a lot of people don't understand. It's a, it's a full summer plant. It loves heat. It does not like cold to get started. So look at the set out date for uh, pepper plants, June 15th. That's two months away, more than two months away. So you don't need to start them until May 7th. And if you have started them, you have to keep them uh, well, uh, uh, you get lots of sun. They're a sun loving plant. And it's really the heat of summer that gives them their, their wonderful flavor. And my experience with peppers is they always seem to hold on long into the fall. Um, and they also produce very well in general and uh, often need a small cage to hold them up. They get floppy in a wind. Well, we've had some wind like what we have at the time. And the other thing I always remember is that breaking a, a pepper off sometimes can tear the branch off. So uh, I tend to use uh, snips to uh, separate, which it can be, if you're growing a lot of pepper plants, can be arduous, but nonetheless. So there's a little bowl of, them, of, the, of the big three that you can identify each of them. Wouldn't it be fun to have a bowl of fruit like that? I want to stop for a second and uh, praise again that graphic, that, that visual, that illustration you see there. A lot of people kind of poo poo zinnias. Look at the colors on that plant. And I want to all but guarantee you, if you grow zinnias in your garden, the butterflies will come to it. They love zinnias. And also do hummingbirds. Uh, so they're, they're a wonderful plant that also makes great cut flowers, and they're a cut and come plant. Their one kind of drawback is that as the cool, moist days of later summer or early fall come on, they, they can get mildew, but they'll still be fine. Um, the text of this slide uh, encourages you to plant uh, things that are good for butterflies, birds, insects of all sorts. I try to put some uh, uh, natives there, especially uh, coneflower, asters, ber bergamot. Uh, the wild bergamot is a lovely mild purple color and it's got a wonderful fragrance. Uh, as you know, the milkweed uh, is important for the monarch butterfly. If you've ever come across a, a monarch chrysalis, you've seen one of the most beautiful things that the Midwest has to offer, the little jewels. I wouldn't even try to describe it, but uh, they do a lot of uh, virtue to 
to green and black and gold, all of those little crystals. The bottom three, the blue lobelia, white indigo, the plesiorite, and joe pie weed, all these are great attractants. And I want to go back to Dylan Fennel. I, I read a post not too frequently, uh, recently, about a woman who was complaining that uh, her fennel had all these worms on it, and she was doing everything she could to pick them off and kill them. And I'm thinking, oi, <laughs> the butterflies that she dispatched. Uh, butterflies love fennel, and they're not going to eat very much. It's the same true with dill. Uh, they, they don't consume very much of the plant. I've also liked parsley as a garden edging. Instead of, you know, rocks or, or a plastic liner, if you edge curved areas of the garden with parsley, it's just gorgeous, as well as a, a wonderful thing to consume or to add to all the things that you cook. So I'm going to jump right now into lawn care. Um, I know that uh, there's a lot of disparagement to lawns and, and, you know, talking back to the English tradition of having sheep or uh, servants, uh, people cook, but you know, if you think about old Park and River Forest area, lawns are a beautiful addition to our life. And what's neater than to, to walk along uh, and uh, in your bare feet and to see uh, uh, the grass growing? Nice graphic here as well. You start working with the lawn when it's actively growing, not before. Clean up the uh, debris that's fallen over the winter and compost it. Um, the best thing you can do for lawn in the springtime is to get a core aeration, which is... Uh, excavating little divots that leave uh, round little holes all over the lawn. And what that does is it lets air into the roots, which can uh, not, uh, fail to have because of so much compaction. And that's a really a job for professionals. And then the next thing you would do would be overseed with a good quality grass seed that's dedicated to where you're throwing it, whether it's for shade or heavy traffic or full sun. And then finally, after you've thrown grass seed around and you don't need a fancy uh, winding uh, a dispenser. You just dig your hand in the bag and kind of toss it around lightly in the in the wind, and that does just fine. Uh, also, uh, know that uh, some grass uh, tends to brown out in July and in August. That's because the, it's native to their uh, they're, they're adapted to uh, going dormant in the drought. That you know what happens in August. Everything is dry for a long while. So the grass seed goes dormant, the grass goes dormant, and it comes back a lot as the fall rains come on. And you may probably be aware that grass does not grow in full shade. You can try again and again and again, but it just won't happen. And also, what do you top dress with? Well, a half inch of, of uh, finished uh, compost is actually the best, but also so as well-aged manure, which would not have an odor to it. Um, you know, there's there's uh, lawn care companies uh, and product uh, sellers that want to get you to buy a program of five products over a whole growing season. You don't need to do that. The right time to fertilize a lawn is mid-April and mid-September, but not through the summertime. Mow your grass high, at least three and a half inches. And the point of that is to keep the roots cool and also keep root the weeds seeds from sprouting. Leave the clippings on the lawn. I never understand why people want to continually lift the clippings and then you have to dispose of them and they go into what? Well, compost, of course. Uh, leave them right on the lawn and there are biological life that will bring them in. I've actually watched worms come up, grab hold of a blade of grass and bring it right down into their burrow. I mean, you're, you're feeding them. You're also saving fertilizer. This, it fertilizes the lawn. And uh, if you water the lawn, please make sure that the water stays on the lawn, but doesn't get on the sidewalk or the street. It's a, it's a, not a good thing to do. And uh, quickly about lawn mowing, you know, we, we mow the lawn 22 times a season. Every time I think of that, it sounds like it's such a chore. My wife and I used to fight with each other about who got to do it. It's a lot of fun. I will say, uh, and I might mention this about tools, when you're mowing the lawn, you shouldn't wear eye protection because lawn mowers can throw rocks, acorns, whatever, that can carry them off of a fence or whatever, hitting them in the eye. You should uh, also wear closed toe shoes. This is not the time to wear flip flops um, when you're mowing the lawn. You have to service a lawnmower every springtime. Uh, it's not just one of those turn the key and off you run. If it's a gas engine, a lawnmower, you need to change the spark plug, change especially the air filter, also to uh, check the oil and if it see if it's uh, smudgy or fairly clean and then add fresh fuel. And 
a caution here, you should always fuel uh, any machines outside, not in buildings. If you have a spill and a fire, you don't want the building to go up. Both gas powered lawnmowers and electric powered lawnmowers have blades that need sharpening every year. You can actually do this yourself. It's a pretty straightforward project. It takes a file, it takes a, a wrench, it takes a stick to belay the, the blade as you're taking it off. But if you're not a little bit handy and they're trepidatious about that, take the lawnmower to a lawn care professional. It really should be sharpened. It does a much better job. We uh, often think about tools in a garden. Those of you uh, who have taken my long uh, tool care workshop, you poor sufferers, remember uh, the kind of mantra, you should keep your tools clean, in good repair, sharp, uh, lubricated, and stored correctly. Those are the five topics we always dealt with in that workshop. There's a brief list of, uh, of uh, uh, tools that you would have, but you probably have your own kit that you use, and I hope that you do keep them clean. It's I always advise that at the end of a gardening session, you clean your tools before you put them away. That way, when you start the next gardening session, you've got clean tools to work with. A sharp tool is a safe tool. It's not only safe for you to use, but it respects the plant that you're going to work on too, because it does a good, efficient cut rather than crushing it and opening the plant uh, to insects or disease. Uh, in the second column, all the way down to the bottom is one of my favorite tools is a garden knife. Uh, this is about 10 inches long, nice wide stainless steel blade serrated on one side. And it's a wonderful tool for lots of different uh, uses, for stirring, for mixing, for helping dislodge a plant from a pot, from cutting perennial uh, clumps into pieces. It's a great tool, uh, fits very well in the hand. So if, if there's anything there that you need, uh, now's the time to go shopping for them. Um, I don't know if any of you are tall like I am, but uh, one of the problems I have with long handled tools is they are made by people in Asia and people in Asia are short. So their long handles are short, which ache my back all the time. So I find really quality long handled tools at uh, resale, either uh, uh, rummage sales or uh, secondhand stores. Those tools are much longer handled and much easier for me to use. And I think the next slide will show you uh, my daughter's favorite gardening tool in the upper right hand corner there is a what's called a stirrup hoe. Stirrup, obviously, for that uh, uh, thing that's attached to a horse's saddle that allows the rider to, to control and sit high in the saddle and control. Maybe you know that was the thing that kept them, that allowed the Mongols to. Uh, uh, to take over Europe, uh, they developed the stirrup for the writing. Anyway, that's a wonderful little tool. It's long handle. It's if you can see, it's got a little hinge right above the metal loop, and so when you push it, it bends one way. When you pull it, it kind of wiggles back to the other way, and it's great for sliding right through the top of a soil, cutting the weeds off right below the surface of the soil. And it's a very efficient tool. My daughter just loves it. And there you see on the left a uh, the mantra about keeping tools uh, clean. It, it, you should check them at this time of year. If you had a tool that was kind of wonky, and, and this can happen, especially to any hinge tool, by using them hard. Sometimes I'm, I know I, I've done this. I've used a, a pair of loppers right up against the fence trying to take out a, 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 a vagrant shrub. And I would grab hold of that and give it a good yank, this this lopper, and I'd be holding onto the chain link fence and ruin the blade. Then you can fix that, but oftentimes we don't do that right at that moment. So this is the time to check. There's there's by the way the the lubricants I strongly encourage for wooden handles, sand the handles down and cover them with boiled linseed oil. They'll take on a great patina, and and it actually brings life back to the wood. For uh, metal parts that get opened up by your, your sharpening them mineral oil it's na it's natural uh it doesn't hurt the soil at all it doesn't hurt you and finally if you're actually storing tools over the winter time petroleum jelly works like a charm it's cheap and it, it, it uh, keeps uh, moisture and air from uh, letting rust grow so here a real quick uh treatment of compost um I jokingly say that whatever the problem is, the answer is compost. And the reason I say that is uh, for that second paragraph there, 
it feeds the life in the soil in a way that plants through the roots can take most advantage of it. So sometimes when a, a fertilizer goes into the soil, the plants can get burned or the, or the roots can get burned. Not so with compost. Plus there's all kinds of nutrients in compost way past what you can get in a bag of soil, a bag of fertilizer. It amends soil so that it can hold more air and water. And we often forget that roots need both those. It's essential to them. Uh, it, it slowly releases nutrients rather than in a big pulse. And this is part of the miracle is it buffers disease. It has the capacity to surround disease with these little life forms and doesn't let it get to the plant. And finally, it saves money. Now, you'll see that formula down there at the bottom. 3C plus 1N plus H2O plus O2 equals humus. Uh, that, that may seem off-putting, but it's not. The C is what we refer to as browns. The N is what we refer to as greens. Compost really is a mixture of carboniferous materials and nitrogenous materials. The carbon materials are things like sticks and twigs and leaves and sawdust and newsprint, uh, anything that's not glossy or color. And so uh, the nitrogen material is basically what comes out of your kitchen, all the fruits and vegetables, as well as weeds and uh, clippings and tops of things in the garden. All that green material, uh, if you give it away, uh, you're losing something. Uh, also notice that uh, a compost pile requires a fairly good supply of, of water and also air. And it's the air that people often forget about. There's a nice little tool called a compost stirrer, which is basically a rod with a flange on the end that you pulse into a compost pile, pick up and agitate a little bit, and it forms air pockets. So every time that you want to make a, a compost addition, you kind of want to just throw the kitchen material in there, the, the nitrogen material, but it also needs three times more in portion of carbon material. That's where uh, you often get in trouble in a compost pile when it starts smelling because you got too much N and not enough C. Uh, one of the things I used to do is uh, in the fall, I would use a battery or electric operated leaf blower that has a reversal mechanism on it where you can vacuum up leaves. And so as it vacuums up the leaves, it chops it finely and stores it in a bag that you've got on the machine. And I end up with a whole barrel full of chopped leaves, which is the browns for all the greens I add in. Um, the, other, the only other thing that you'd want to add to a compost pile is about a half a shovel full of dirt. That's all the inoculation you need. You don't ever need to buy a commercial inoculant because all the life forms are in there. And I strongly suggest that compost piles be situated right on the soil so that critters like worms and whatnot can migrate up through. Is compost valuable? Well, perhaps you know that the village is a composting program. You can get in on that, you get an extra uh, container out behind your house where compost goes in and they take it off and compost it at a commercial facility. And then every Thursday, starting in April, a truckload of compost is brought to Ream Pool parking lot. It's dumped on Thursday and by Friday evening, it's all gone. That's how valuable that compost is. You almost can't get to it. And of course, it's not for the public. It's really for people who are in that program, well, the public that have signed on to the village's compost program. So it's a wonderful uh, addition you can actually use it in, in house plants, and compost also can be part of seed starting. Uh, if you mix about 20% of your seed starting mix with, with compost, the seeds just love it, and it also does those things like suppresses disease. So what do you do with it? You top dress beds. Uh, one of the things that you would do at this time of year in the spring with compost is to lay an inch to two inches of compost over the top of the bed, work it, if you, work it in if you'd like. Uh, it's time to renovate the compost pile, which uh, if you have a, a one that you can actually dump everything out, that's basically the best thing to do. Harvest the finished compost and the stuff that isn't finished or uh, forms the basis for what's coming forward. Again, just a reminder, three times browns, one times greens and water and aerating by stirring or tossing. Uh, let, let me just say, uh, I wasn't always a composter, but uh, I thought, you know, why not try this thing? So what I did is I took the bottom, I cut the bottom off a 50 gallon garbage barrel and drilled quarter inch holes all the way around it. So I had a barrel that was light 
I mean, you can lift it up with one hand. And so I began to put everything in it that I talked about. Waste from the kitchen, stuff around the garden. I stupidly put stuff in like rib bones. And one year, the whole turkey carcass, which was wrong. I didn't know any better at the time. But what was neat about this barrel is I could lift it up very easily, put it on the side, and then rebuild it with the top of it's in the compost pile before it goes in the bottom, just flips it over. And whenever I did that, it ate itself down in half. It taught me that there was a life form going on there. And then I took training in composting. And that's still a, a very good, simple system. Um, but uh, the thing that I learned by getting more into compost is I, I became much more aware of the life that's going on in a garden other than just the plants. And it made me a better gardener. I, I cared more about the plants. I cared a lot more about the soil. And I also reserved those nutrients that otherwise would be leaving the joint. And I got a lot of free, very high quality stuff. Uh, garden gold is often the phrase used to uh, describe uh, composting. Sorry if the volume keeps going down on me. That's I keep leaning back. Well, Bob Haseman never looked like that uh, yodeling uh, stuff. Uh, please remember that uh, you, you do want to enjoy your garden, not to get so busy that uh, you don't sit down and enjoy it. Do think about uh, plans for the year. Make specific goals. Uh, strongly encourage that you articulate at least three specific goals for the gardening year. Uh, browse those catalogs. There's a gazillion of them. Uh, if Johnny selected seeds or as I didn't mention, the uh, Seed Savers Ch Exchange in uh, Decorah, Iowa. They have thousands of heirloom uh, varieties, and they are a true seed exchange. I think that costs $15 or something to join the, the community, but you have available then to your wonderful different varieties. Also, uh, look to uh, the kinds of seeds planting it inside in terms of the timing for it. Don't rush it. Uh, you can get in trouble with... Uh, your, your plants by uh, letting ambition get in your way. Don't overdo it. Um, and uh, finally, look for a garden buddy, a collaborator, somebody you can call up and say, I've got some leftover seeds, or I've got this problem, what should I do? And uh, it would make for a better gardening year for all of you. So thank you for coming tonight and your attention. And uh, if, if Casey has any questions that we've generated, I'd be glad to address them to the best I could. Fantastic. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Don, for a, a wonderful presentation and um, really great tips that you shared today. It's um, clear how much knowledge you have, and I'm we're very um, happy that you shared it with us here tonight. So um, I have about nine or 10 questions for you um, from the chat. So um, we'll try to get through as many as we can, um, and I'll just kind of go in order as they were received throughout your presentation. Um, the first one comes from Barbara, and Barbara's asking if you can describe the DIY percolating soil test. Sure. Again, um, you're digging a hole, Barbara. 10 inches by 10 inches, 10 inches deep, 10 inches wide, and putting that soil off to the side. Fill that hole with water. Wait till all of the water drains out, and then fill the hole again. If it, it doesn't drain out in four hours or less, you have clay soil. And the, what's wrong with clay soil is it drowns out the roots. It can't get the oxygen that it needs. So that's the kind of soil that you would try to amend. To tell you the truth, it's very difficult to change a soil profile. So that's the kind of case where if you have a soil that's that um, logged uh, with water, you might want a raised bed uh, or uh, growing in containers or these wonderful uh, flow, uh, pot, uh, fabric pots. I've often grown uh, root vegetables in fabric pots. So I hope that answers the question, Barbara. Great, thank you, Don, appreciate it. And um, Barbara, let us know if you have any follow-up questions. Um, and then Sue has a couple of questions about lettuce. Um, the first one is, so um, this year she got lettuce seed that are in pellets um, and was told they hold 10 seeds each. Um, why is this done? They had a lot of seeds left over. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to this, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, uh, if you looked at how the conservatory uh, itself starts plants, they start uh, in uh, trays that have, I don't know, thousands of seeds, and you get a bazillion seedlings, and uh, FOPCON volunteers 
very daintily separate each one of these out and eventually pot them up for the plant sale. So it might be something like that, so that, that that's going on to try and get uh, what's the name of those uh, those special kinds of, of trays? I can't think of it right now, but um, that that may be what's going on. You know what? Give it a try. Um, there's another kind of uh, uh, test for vi uh, viability that comes to mind and, and sort of reference to this. If you have some old seeds and you want to find out if they're still viable, take 10 of them, put them in, inside of several folds of moistened paper towels, 10 of them. Put those in a moist, dark place, like in a paper bag, uh, and keep them moist for seven to 10 days. The number of seeds that germinate will tell you the percentage of viability of those seeds in the seed packet. The same, you might try that, Sue, with the pellet. Just put it in uh, uh, some, uh, fold it over, uh, or or right into some planting soil. Uh, I didn't say this yet, but I, I'm, I, I, I'm sort of assuming it, but we start seeds in soilless mix. We don't start in the straight garden soil, because straight garden soil, again, is alive. And literally, uh, dainty little seed, seedlings will get killed off by what's called planting off disease. It's not just one disease, it's a whole bunch of critters that, that are, they, they grab hold and cut the plant right at the, the little seedling at the surface level. So we soil this mix. And that's basically what you're doing with, I even have a friend who masticates mechanically brown paper bags and uses that much as her planting medium. Uh, it's sterile, it's free, uh, and she gets a pretty good, pretty good charge. There's lots of experimenting to do. Uh, Sue has another question. Yeah, really helpful, uh, John. Appreciate that. And then her next question is, um, what is uh, a best practice using a cold frame with lettuce? Plant it now. I, you know, I would plant lettuce in a cold frame in February, early February, because it's a cold loving plant. Um, and a cold frame generally doesn't freeze. Um, there are those people who actually put compost in the base of a cold frame to act as a heating pad. As it as it generates heat, it will actually warm uh, warm the seed bed. But yes, I I would start uh, certainly in March. Uh, put down a, I would say a good potting soil. Sprinkle some seeds. Cover them very very lightly, and uh, they'll sprout very quickly. And be prepared to thin them. Uh, I like to grow uh, leaf lettuces rather than head lettuces. Although uh, butter head or butter crunch lettuce, they're just plain delicious. But there are beautiful, beautiful lettuces. And as you likely know, the darker the leaf, the healthier it is. So there are some lettuces like red sails. That's a, a beautiful lettuce. There's oak leaf lettuce. The leaves look like oak. I mean, it, lettuce is just a wonderful crop. And and really, we should be growing our own. It's not cheap in the store. I don't know what is. Maybe the air. Yes, another Sue? That's great. Appreciate that. So um, actually, now we have a couple of questions from Judy. Um, and her first question is, um, for the big three, are we starting seeds for these plants indoors or is it direct sow? Uh, for tomatoes? Is that the question? Yes, indoors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny. I, I've actually looked at one site where uh, uh, a gentleman gardener suggested that we start tomato seeds outdoors. And as I thought about it, uh, tomatoes are part of what's called the solanum family. And that includes potatoes as well as tomatoes. Actually, peppers are in that same family. And the trouble with peppers, I'm sorry, with potatoes and tomatoes is they attract disease and that disease falls off the plants and gets into the soil. And so if you continue to plant tomatoes or potatoes in the same place, you're gonna get disease plants moving forward. So the, the point of all that is at the end of a growing season, both those plant families need to be completely cleaned out of a garden leave nothing behind. And then, and if you've ever grown potatoes, you often get these little tiny marbles that are in the soil. Those should go too. Uh, but uh, if you've ever left a tomato in the garden over winter, the shock is that right about now, you see a little tomato seedling coming up. Uh, so his idea is that uh, you might try putting some tomato seeds out there. But as I said before, they probably won't mature any sooner than the reason why we start seeds indoors anyway is to bring them to a better stage of maturity so they have a jump start on the season. It's just you don't want to harm them by uh, 
by uh, stunting them or setting them back when you uh, set them in the cold soil. You know, you get a warm soil by covering it with either plastic or uh, maybe you've seen those little uh, tomato towers. They look like a, a little pockets, little uh, cells of water uh, uh, that uh, tomatoes are planted inside of and that they form a little greenhouse there. Did Judy have another question? Um, yes. So next question, moving on to tools, um, what should we use to clean our tools? I know you, you dug into this a little bit, but is there something that you would recommend in terms of cleaning them? Uh, yes, soap and water and a, uh, a, a scrub brush of some sort, a scrub a pad uh, will take most things off. If you have built up sap, uh, uh, you can use alcohol, works very nicely. Uh, some people actually use WD-40. Uh, there's a lot to say about WD-40, but um, it's it's a universal solvent of sorts. But alcohol is is very, very good for that. And then uh, part of what uh, alcohol does is sterilizes at the same time. Um, and then uh, also, if you've got a lot of built up stuff, a, uh, a file works very nicely to, to take off rust on especially in shovels um, that oftentimes uh, take the worst beating in the world. Um, uh, steel wool also works very, very nicely. Of course, steel wool. Um, and then again, anytime you, you open up metal uh, by, by scrubbing it or steel wooling it, you need to cover it with something. And that's why we give it a final coating of mineral oil. Um, okay. Really helpful. Um, and then Noreen had a question um, about sharpening your tools. Can you take them to a knife sharpening place? Do you know yes. if that's a service? Yes, you can. And there's a variety around. There's one on uh, uh, Roosevelt Road, just east of Ridgeland on the north side of the street. There's one straight south on Des Plaines, uh, which backs onto the uh, uh, National Guard uh, community there. Uh, both those places do very professional uh, sharpening. I, I know I've taken uh, hand saws over to them, chainsaws uh, sharpening, uh, and uh, I'm sure they would do tools for you. I think at the farmer's, uh, uh, what's the, what's the, uh, what's in the church parking lot in the summer? The case well, the here. farmer's market? The farmer's market. For the last Last season, there was a gentleman there who was sharpening uh, tools. It's not hard to learn to sharpen. You just have to be patient. And, you know, if you go into any hardware store, especially, the you know, here in Oak Park, uh, there's one and out in Forest Park, there's one. They have on the, sh on the wall uh, whetstones. And uh, basically what you're doing with sharpening a knife is reproducing the angle of uh, the blade that's already on there. And um, uh, I, I have to put a I, uh, a mention of, of YouTube here. YouTube, if, no matter what it is you want to do, YouTube will tell you how to do it, sometimes even wrong. But uh, I found it very, very helpful. Uh, I'm about to wake up a couple of chainsaws and I'm going to go back to YouTube and get my lessons again about what, what they need to uh, to come alive again. Even though, I, you know, if you don't do something for a bunch of months, you forget. So anyway, YouTube is a very good source for learning how to, to sharpen things. Very helpful. I appreciate that. And as you were talking, Sue also mentioned in the chat the the um, sharpener at the farmer's market. So um, good tip, definitely. Um, Noreen, um, you also had a question. So um, what are ideas for lawns with lots of creeping Charlie, et cetera? Uh, first, uh, we should have a vigilante group to find the people who imported that plant. Uh, uh, there are also, maybe it's we could call them herbalists, who believe that it's a very healthy plant to eat. I, I don't know if it is or it isn't. I do know that it teaches a person to curse because it is an awful plant. I think its botanical name is, it's either glachoma or glaucoma. I think it's glaucoma. And um, uh, it's very, very, very difficult to get with a, rid of. There was a sort of, how do I put this, a, uh, a hippie uh, treatment for, um, for ground ivy is another name for it which is to spread borax uh, on the uh, Creeping Charlie, and that would suppress it. Um, 
and you had to be careful not to get that near any pine tree roots because it'll kill pine trees. And what, where did you get the borax? Well, 22 yield clean borax. That, that close soap is, a, is, is what borax is. Uh, it never worked. I tried it a bunch of times and then you got boraxy soil. Um, the best way for all of us to do is mechanically. You get down, sit down with a claw or a, you can do it standing with a bow rake, but a claw works best and you work one, you know, work east to west and then you work north to south and trying best to get those stolons, which it, it's how it spreads. And in each node of the stolon, it sends down roots and at each of those nodes, you, there's another swear word to use because they just keep coming and coming and coming. And they migrate out of the lawn, especially into flower beds and vegetable beds. And so I, in, in, in all candor, I think the best thing to do is try to control it rather than a notion that you can actually defeat it. Uh, um, I really think we should send this to Russia and other places like that if they don't already have a good stand of it. Um, and you, you wouldn't want to compost it either because it, it, it is a tricky, tricky thing. Thistle is another son of a gun. That if we get into a, a growing patch, they, they have very deep roots. And if you don't get every little segment of root, the thistle keeps coming back. What's true of, of Creeping Charlie and true of thistle is you don't let it go to seed. And you'll see in about two weeks time, uh, Creeping Charlie will begin these lovely little purple blue flowers. You think, oh, look at my lovely lawn. Well, kiss your lawn goodbye. You got a now a fine growth of, of uh, creeping Charlie. So my condolences. I've fought it for years. I've had it. I have it up in Wisconsin. We got it down here in Oak Park. Um, and again, it was imported. This is not a native. Uh, so, GD, MF, all those things that you want to say about uh, bad plants, whatever those letters stand for. <laughs> Easy. Very helpful. No, appreciate that. Um, and and uh, appreciate the commiseration as well. Um, so we have just three more questions for you. Um, and going back into compost and soil, um, the first of those three is, can you add too much compost? No. <laughs> you can grow in, in straight compost, um, but uh, it would be unwise. Why uh, not spread it out and spread that well uh, to the wider patch? Uh, so uh, I've never heard of anybody saying I have too much compost. But if you thought you did, if you had so much that you could get, gather a gallon of it and put it inside a mesh bag of some sort, a burlap bag, for instance, and closed it tight and put that in a five-gallon plastic uh, bucket and added water and two tablespoons of unsulfured molasses. And one last thing, a aquarium air bubbler held down so it stays in the bottom of that thing and let it run for three days. What you would have is what's called compost tea, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, a solution to spread either in your uh, garden. I, I used it on house plants. It, you, it just does wonders for, for plants because it, it's like an instant pulse of, of wonderful fertility. So if you've got too much compost, try to make compost tea. It's not all that complex to do. Uh, and it, it requires that you have some finished compost to work with initially. And if you know somebody who composts and you want to do this, just try to get a, a gallon's worth of compost from them. It's not all that much. Casey? Right. Um, and then uh, Noreen also had a question. Um, so she has almost whole leaves sitting in her garden from the fall. Um, should she remove them or turn them into the soil? Oh, good for you. Good for you. One of the things that we want to change about how people approach their garden, uh, there's an aesthetic out there that a garden should be clean. And, and so you see a lot around Oak Park, people have taken their gardens down to bare soil already. I, I have to say, so also has the Park District cut down most of their vegetation as I move around. In fact, I mean to talk to somebody about that. Uh, I'd have to find somebody who's on the board. Uh, I wonder if Sandy still does. So anyway, um, you want to leave the leaves on the ground as long as possible. How long? Well, until the weather settles, until the air temperature is a reliable 55 degrees for seven to 10 days. That's the official recommendation. And why do that? That's when the insects that have uh, uh, burrowed into all of those 
of parts of plants come uh, germ uh, come back alive, they rejuvenate. And if you cut that stuff down and get rid of all that, you've lost all of that uh, material that, you know, the, the insects feed each other. And some insects are very beneficial in the garden, like pollinators. Insects also feed birds, and birds are wonderful. Uh, 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 take out and all. I mean, um, I don't know if you know, but a, a hummingbird will eat as much as a thousand mosquitoes a day. And, and uh, I'm all for it. I, uh, so, anyway, yes, leave the leaves in your garden. Uh, there's a slide somewhere that shows a, a, I saw a garden across from Longfellow School's entrance that was chock a block loaded with seeds of uh, leaves and uh, daffodils had come up and some spring ephemerals had come up. So they'll come right up through. Um, what you don't want is too thick a mat of, of leaves because it will actually act uh, to grow uh, fungus underneath there. Uh, and so in the fall, uh, the best thing to do with leaves is bury them. Uh, in, in all of the finished areas of your garden, bury as much leaves as you possibly can. Uh, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating here. Dig a ditch, fill the ditch full of leaves, put all the soil back in the ditch. In the spring, you won't find a leaf. What you'll find is a bazillion worms uh, who are leaving worm castings all over the place. Um, so uh, yes, uh, you know, move those leaves around a little bit. If, uh, if no uh, moisture is getting through, you really need to kind of break them up a little bit. But if it is very moist underneath there, wait for a little while, wait for another, I don't know, I would wait till May to actually take it off. But for a lot of people, can't they can't stand the waiting. I understand it completely. So stretch your aesthetic as long as you possibly can for the benefit of the insects. And part of this all is a, to account for the change in uh, for climate change, is that uh, there's so many more, fewer insects, uh, as you may well know. So very, very many fewer birds. And we're talking per significant percentage fewer birds. Um, as well as insects. Those of you who have been alive long enough and have driven through the countryside in the summer know that your windshields used to get all pockmarked full of insects. Nowadays, that's not the case anymore. It's a fair test of uh, what's happening out in nature. And uh, and I dare say it's billions of birds that are gone now, uh, both species and also in, within species numbers. So you we all want to do our best to support that. And the more that there are support for that in terms of plants and insect life for the birds it's a healthier ecosystem we really do belong to nature and when we grow a garden we're hosting nature and we will take advantage of it did somebody just clip me out of existence there we we'll no. still see you yeah <laughs> That's Go ahead. um do we have okay. one or two more questions casey and then we'll wrap yes okay. perfect we have just one more question and i um, appreciate that great message that you shared um, Don, our last question um, is hopefully an easy one for you. Um, can you recommend a soil? Can I recommend a soil? Um, Dr. Earth is very good and Happy Frog. Those are, those are, have lots of um, micronutrients in them as well as what's referred to as mycorrhizae. That's a uh, part of the mycelium community under uh, the soil or in the soil. And perhaps you're aware that there's more and more and more being learned about fungi uh, all the time, uh, how important it is, how significant it is. In fact, it, it has gotten its own, you know how we talk about the animal kingdom? The fungi are being given its own kingdom. It is so radically different. In fact, fungi are more related to human beings than they are related to plants. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, mycorrhizae referred to a symbiotic relationship between fungi in the form of mycelium and plant roots, and they feed in back and forth with each other, one providing moisture and carbohydrates that uh, uh, come, uh, especially the carbohydrates come from the plant, and the soil chemistry, which is provided by the uh, mycorrhizae. So, anyway... The, the happy frog and, and especially and also dr earth they have those and i i've seen um i believe happy frog at uh uh good earth I've, i'm not lately but i've seen it there and uh, dr earth i've seen at uh, um 
uh, blanking on the name of the horticulture, the green nursery on uh, Displains, south of uh, of uh, Roosevelt Road, you know, McAdam. Oh uh, yeah. They carry Dr. Earth or used to. I mentioned they still do. Yeah, you can make you know make your own so, but th that's another topic, right? Yeah, we don't want to. Watch. Did we have any more questions, Casey? Did we get to everyone? Um, I think we got everyone. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, let me first um, say thank you, thank you, thank you to Don um, for presenting uh, to us this evening. Um, you just got the tip of the iceberg. He's so full of knowledge and um, just information about how to help you um, be successful in your garden. But then he also encourages us to experiment and test it out. So don't be afraid of trying something new. And um, I really like that encouragement. So um, thank you so much, Don. Um, we did um, mention things like um, Good Earth. If you are a member of the Friends, you get a 10% discount when you purchase your items at Good Earth. Um, also at McAdam, also at um, Westgate Flowers and Clovers. So another great reason to join the Friends um, and take advantage of supporting local customers. So shop our plant sale and um, keep you know shopping for more things um, at these garden centers. So anyway, um, I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. It was really, really interesting. And um, I think when we all signed up, we weren't sure what this topic was going to be. We just knew it was gonna help us level set our heads for what was coming in the spring. And I think you did a great job of covering a wide range of information but now um, I am texting my um, spouse while we're talking, um, go get the lawnmower sharpened and we need to you know, get some fertilizer for the grass and aerate and everything. So I feel like um, this is the perfect moment for us to do all the things to get ready for growing. So um, everyone um, feel free to say hi to Don, you can unmute if you want, but thank you all for joining us.